from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Tim Connors, John Boy. Congratulate me. Congratulations, Tim. What for? I just had another boy. Seven pounds, twelve ounces. Hey, you like cigars? Sure. Well, come on down and pick one up. Oh, maybe you better pack a suitcase, too. I got one for you out in Culver, Montana. Where is that? I just told you. Out in Montana somewhere. We have a debt policy holder there named Henderson. Henderson, huh? Yeah. Now, we don't know if he was murdered, committed suicide, or had an accident. Well, what does it look like? All three. Okay, Tim. Be there in an hour. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter, whatever it's going to be. Expense account item one, dollar and a quarter for a detailed map. I had an idea that Culver, Montana was a place that only Rand McNally might know about. They did. I found it tucked up in the high northern corner of the state near Great Falls. Hey, where's your bag? Home. I told you to pack it. Now, look. Give me a cigar, Tim. Tell me about the new boy in the new case. Okay, have a chair. There you are. I wouldn't smoke it if I were you. Terrible. Cost me two bucks a box. Hey, you know something? I'm thinking of naming the new boy Johnny. Oh, tough case, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Look, look. We're in the same sweet old spot, Johnny. Same old problem. One of our policyholders is dead, and for looking into the circumstances of his death... The insurance company is no longer a friend of the widow and orphan, but a big, bad monster trying to weasel out of a just claim. All claims are just claims, or are they? Well, of course they are. No one ever tried to pull a fast one on an insurance company. Well, the world's full of nice, honest, straight-playing people. Ah, uh-huh. now tell me about getting sandbagged in a poker game. Look, I want to get this out of the way and get back over to the hospital and see my wife. Now, John, this claim came into the insurance office yesterday afternoon, airmail special. The insurance company turned it over to me today. What company? Western. The policy's worth $25,000 face value, double indemnity if death was by accident. No payment for suicide. Uh Uh-huh. You say the man's name was Henderson? Yeah, it says here, George Walter Henderson, Montana rancher. Last Thursday, he fell four stories out of a hotel window in Culver and died instantly. At least that's what we have in this report here. Somebody could have shoved him, or he could have taken the leap. Now, we have to know for certain. Oh, what's on the claim report? Accidental. There was no inquest, no police investigation, and that's not good enough for us. Uh Uh-huh. This Henderson prominent? Well, he was big enough, Johnny. Cattleman, rancher. He was also a major stockholder in the only newspaper in Culver, so I doubt if his paper would suggest suicide or anything else. Do you? I don't know, Tim. I never met the editor. Well, meet him if you like. Talk to him. Talk to anybody in Culver. Find out what was what. (laughs) This is a lousy cigar. Johnny... You know how to handle these things. We have to have more information than this. Have you tried to do anything on it at all? Yeah, I phoned the sheriff's office long distance to talk to a man named Holton, E. Holton. He said he'd be happy to cooperate. Well, what else? I phoned the beneficiary to get some information. Name's Pauline Henderson, his widow. Is she going to cooperate, too? I don't think so, pal. Huh? She hung up on me. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounzo the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merry one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, 
merry as talking as Santa ever, sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 90, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item two, $185.65. Airfare, Hartford, Connecticut to Great Falls, Montana. The nearest point I could make to Culver by air. Item three, three bucks. I took the train to Culver. Sometimes when I'm having nightmares, I dream about the smelter stack standing up against the cadaverous hills that lie to the south of town. Everything, including the three or four feet of snow covered with a uniform dinginess, made Culver an ugly little town set in an ugly notch between two ugly mountains. The only hotel in town was the Butte. It happened to be four stories high. It also happened to be the place where George Henderson had met his death. Okay, just a minute. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. I'm Eve Holton, sheriff here. Huh? You're from the insurance people, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Been expecting that you'd be in sooner or later. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Holton. Call me Eve, son. Everybody does. And uh, hey, uh, got a drink on you? And uh, no, I haven't. Well, I got one on me. <laughs> nice and chilly, too. <laughs> well, I'll see if there's some glasses around here, Sheriff. Hey, you didn't waste any time looking me up. No, I guess I didn't, son. Thought it'd save a little time this way. Knew you'd be looking me up sooner or later. I really thought we ought to have this drink together. Private. May not have any more together while you're here. Uh-huh. Well, health and happiness, boy. Uh, same to you. <clears throat> now, this drink we're having. This is in your room, and I'm just a fellow welcoming you to Culver. In my office or on that street out there, I'm a sheriff. And I'm going to be real official. All right, go on. I want you to notice I'm not asking any questions of you, son. I'm just answering anything that you might want to ask me right now. All right. You're going to have to plow ahead yourself on this one pretty much alone. And let me tell you what kind of plowing you got in store for you. Excuse me. (sighs) Now, first off, this is a little burg like you ain't used to. We got 3,500, 4,000 people living here. Some of them work in that mine you've seen on your way into town. Others hire out to work on the ranches around here. Some in business. Uh Uh-huh. Very tight little place. We hardly ever fool around with anybody else. Sure. Now, you're here because your insurance company don't like to pay off on a policy without knowing whys and wherefores. They don't like the word accident without knowing some of the details. No, they don't. There's a lot of people here, most people, who don't care about those details. As a matter of fact, son, they'd all just as soon put old George Henderson down in the ground and say it was an accident and let it go with that. Well, maybe it was, Sheriff. I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Yeah, well, now, let me go on. Those people who don't like the details don't like detail getters. You understand? Uh, yeah. Scare you any? Not yet. <laughs> you do all right, son. So, maybe you'd kind of like to get your coat on and come to your funeral with me. Starts at three. Anderson's? Yeah. Give you a chance to look around, get the lay of the land. Okay, good idea. I wondered what kind of bull workers insurance companies turned out. I like you, Dollar. You're all right. You ain't bothering with any questions till you got some worthwhile asking. 
You tired? A little. Well, this won't take too long. A half hour later, I was standing beside Sheriff Eve Holton on a flat top hillside that served as a cemetery. The snow was white and gleaming under the winter sun of the mid afternoon skies, the air cold and crisp. To thee, our Heavenly Father, who knoweth all things, we commit the body of our beloved to thy eternal care. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Trusting ever in thy mercy, we invoke the consolation of thy sheltering wing. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And sure and certain hope of resurrection into eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Poor George. Eve. Hmm? Which one is Mrs. Henderson? There. That's Pauline Henderson? Yeah, that's her. Well, she can't be more than 25. 26, to be exact, daughter. I went to her birthday party two months ago. Well, how old was George Henderson? 59. Went to his party, too. Yeah. Pretty thing, hmm? Very. Any other family? Nope. No other wife, huh? Nope. Want to meet her? No, not right now. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, suit yourself. Kind of thought you might start thinking when you got a look at her. Mm Hmm? Now, now, just keep on the way you're doing. You're doing fine. When there's something you got to know, you'll find out. Well, Eve, I already know one thing. Yeah? What's that? I'm going to ask for a coroner's inquest. Just from seeing her? Just from seeing her. Mm Mm-hmm. You're a sly one, Johnny. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your Giant Animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. Tomorrow, I find out how hard it is to believe what I see. And I see plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. Keith Holden. How are you this morning? Oh, pretty good, Sheriff. How about yourself? Oh, I'm fine, Dandy. You were over at the city hall this morning, huh? Yeah, that's right. I requested the coroner to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Yeah, I know. The coroner left it up to me. Huh? Yeah, came into my office and asked me if I had any reason to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. I told him I didn't have any reason, but I'd do it if I was ordered to. Well, what happens now? Well, somebody will have to decide whether there's going to be an inquest or not. Who? Mayor, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, you stirred up some action, and you'll be getting it. Yeah, where? Just stay where you are, son. My guess is it'll come right to you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The death of George Henderson of Culver, Montana, where I am today. A casual certification announced the death is accidental, having been received by a fall from a hotel window. No one in Culver seemed to be too worried about any of the details. But details are my job. That's why I requested the coroner's office to conduct an inquest. I took Sheriff Holton's suggestion and waited to see what my request flushed up in the dingy-colored mountains of Culver. An hour later, my first bird winged up to my hotel room. He was a tall, gray-haired man in a Stetson, earmuffs, and the western version of a Chesterfield. His honor, Mayor Newton. Mr. Dollar, I want to talk to you about this request you made for an inquest into George Henderson's death. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. You are aware, of course, that George's death, and he was one of my beloved and personal friends for many, many years, was a great blow to the entire community. No, I didn't know that, Mayor Newton. Huh? Only the smallest part of the community were at his funeral yesterday afternoon. His widow and, I'd say, not more than half a dozen other people. Ah. <clears throat> Well, I understand that your insurance company is not quite satisfied with the certification. Is that correct? Uh, more or less. What would they need to be satisfied, sir? An exact knowledge of how Mr. Henderson fell out that hotel window. I would rather no inquest were held into Mr. Henderson's death. Why? Why, sir, George Henderson is dead and buried. It should remain that way. If an inquest were to be held, it would only prove that George fell out of a window... I beg you to consider that, Mr. Dollar. You seem very certain that an investigation would prove that death was accidental. It was accidental. George fell out the window. Well, now, I can't just tell that to my insurance company, can I? Uh, We are a small community with a rudimentary police force, not equipped in any way for an exhaustive investigation, nor for the financial burden of such an investigation. I strongly urge you to reconsider this request for a coroner's inquest. You do? I do indeed. His untimely death was an unfortunate occurrence, outside the pale of any of our poor abilities to foresee. A terrible, terrible accident. I'd like proof of that. Proof? An inquest, Mr. Mayor. An inquest. All right. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounce the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Rusko the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. 
But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 46 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. My interview with Mayor Newton had convinced me that I'd get no real help from him in the Henderson matter. Quite the contrary. Expense account item three, 20 cents coffee. Myself and Sheriff Eve Holton. Well, you got it. Huh? At the direction of Mr. Jackson. That's our coroner. He deputized me temporarily to conduct an inquest. It's going to take place tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, City Hall. Tomorrow, Sheriff? Room 207. Well, Eve, you won't have time to do anything. No, I guess I won't. Not much, anyhow. Oh, brother... The mayor pitched me pretty hard for not having the inquest. Knew he would. Any idea why? Nope. You think somebody asked him to stop it? Yep. Who? Don't know, Johnny. Honest. The next morning, I struggled my way against a belligerent north wind to City Hall and the inquest, if you could call it that. I sat in the back of the room and listened while a Dr. Horace Nam assured the six-man jury that George Henderson was quite dead when he was called out of his office and examined him on the street. Dr. Nam reckoned George had died from a broken neck. An ancient bellhop, a desk clerk, and a chambermaid gave their versions of what had happened the day Henderson fell out the window. Ah, uh, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you God. I do, Sheriff. <laughs> I'm the acting coroner today, Miss Cubley. Uh, sit down. <clears throat> now... When did you see Mr. Henderson last? Last Thursday morning. Where was this, Miss Cubley? At the Butte Hotel. Mm-hmm. You know what time of the morning it was? About 10 o'clock. I went in to make his bed and straighten up his room. I see. I made his bed while he worked on some papers there, and then I left. Did you see him after that? No, sir. You didn't see him come downstairs for breakfast or anything? No, sir. Do you know if anybody went up to see him? I believe I saw Mrs. Henderson in the lobby after that. Do you see Mrs. Henderson in this room? Yes, sir. I, I believe that's Mrs. Henderson over there. No, that's Mrs. Henderson. Now, do you know if Mrs. Henderson visited Mr. Henderson in his room? No, sir. I don't know that. Miss Cubley, did you happen to notice if anyone else went up to Mr. Henderson's room that morning? No, sir. It went on all morning long. Sheriff Holton, acting in the coroner's position, questioned person after person. All had more or less the same vague knowledge concerning George Henderson's death. I was most interested in Pauline Henderson's testimony. Now then, Mrs. Henderson, when did you last see your husband? Thursday. I went to see him about noon, maybe a little before. Where did you see him, Miss Henderson? At the Butte Hotel, in his room there. The same room he occupied prior to his death? Of course. The same room from which he fell? Yes. Were you alone when you went to see him, Mrs. Henderson? Yes. I must have left before 12.30. I had an appointment at the dentist. And that was the last time you saw your husband alive? Yes. I was still in the dentist's chair when they told me he'd fallen out the window. What, uh, what did you and your husband talk about, Mrs. Henderson? Must I answer that? Well, we're trying to determine something here. I'd appreciate it. 
George and I discussed our divorce. Could you tell us about that? George and I decided to part about a month ago. He moved out of the house and moved into the hotel. Mm Mm-hmm. Outside of the divorce, were you on good terms? Oh, yes, we've always been on good terms. Mrs. Henderson, do you think there's a chance that he might have thrown himself out that window? Mrs. Mrs. Henderson, do you think he might have thrown himself out that window? No, at least not over us, if that's what you mean. As far as you knew, was your husband in good health? Yes, he was. You happen to know when he was examined last? Oh, a month or so ago. He was in perfect health. Uh, One more thing. Did Mr. Henderson drink? Yes. Did he drink that morning with you? I think he had a couple of drinks. Yes, yes, he had a drink or two while we were talking. He could have stumbled at that window. The clothes were New York, the perfume Paris, the jewelry Tiffany's. The look you might expect it on the Riviera, where everybody tries to act bored with too many good things in life. Her dress, black for the occasion of death, was cut too well and too carefully for her to pass as a grieving widow. She answered the questions without hesitation or emotion. Fifteen minutes later, the jury brought in the expected verdict. Therefore, it is the opinion of this jury that the said deceased George Walter Henderson came to his death as a result of injuries incurred in a fall from the fourth floor of the Butte Hotel at or about 12.45 p.m. on the 19th day of this month. No evidence to the contrary. It is deemed and declared that the manner of death was accidental. Adjourned. And that was it. As far as Culver's people, its police and its mayor were concerned. Yeah, the mayor. Well, Mr. Dollar, I hope you're satisfied. It was a pretty good inquest, Mayor Newton. I trust the official verdict of the jury will answer any questions your insurance company might have had on their minds and clear this whole matter up. Hmm? I'll forward it to them and tell them the circumstances under which the inquest was conducted, Mr. Mayor. Satisfactory, I trust. No, but it served a purpose. Now that everybody thinks it was an accident, everybody will breathe easier. Certainly. Yeah. If everybody's relaxing like that... Somebody's going to get careless. See you, Mr. Mayor. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two-feet-long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your Giant Animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address. To Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. People do get careless tomorrow, all over Culver, Montana. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. Eve Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Uh, the case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole oh, thing... Hold on now, son. Hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, i better come there. You know how folks are around here. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Culver, Montana, to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48. One day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into the death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-196667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. Have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents. Postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve. I... Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well, anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh? When? Uh, Today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, The the room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Uh Aha. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay? No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, you go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? Mr. Dollar, I'd I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one, the mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two, when they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three, Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. (laughs) Yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police. So don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. 
Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, we had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop, no, hold on. Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it. I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George. Born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over, and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Yeah, he wasn't a suicide type. So... Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. Well, you have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again... Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm. And let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's? I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah, sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. Expense account item six, $4.92, tank of gas. I borrowed Sheriff Holton's car and drove the 80-odd miles to Great Falls that afternoon. Mr. Thurber bought lunch. My Lord, I hope there isn't anything to all this, Mr. Dollar. I just hope there isn't. George Henderson. My. Yeah, well, there isn't anything to anything yet, Mr. Thurber. I'm still trying to find out the facts. Oh, I knew you were over in Culver. I tried to call you there a couple of times. You were out both times. Finally, I put in a call to the home office in Hartford. I talked to this man, Connors, with the adjustment agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in, and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh-huh. Now... Oh, look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case. But two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls. He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. 
Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out. Huh? Yes, I suppose so. I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have Wait a minute. Maddie Knickerbocker. Just a schoolteacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left on my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, of... I, I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Oh, somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. Then it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. Well, tell me about them. Well, go ahead, Mr. Thurber. Uh, now, look, accidents rarely have reason behind them. Suicides and murders always do. You don't think it was an accident? Well, let's say I've heard enough and seen enough to make it a draw so far. Go ahead, tell me about them. And I wish I was married to Mrs. Henderson. I mean, I wish she could see me. I think most any man who's ever met her hoped the same thing. Young men, old men, any kind. But she picked George. George was as tough and leathery as these mountains around us. Exactly her opposite. But Pauline married him. He raised her. He was close to her all her adult life. Yes. But Mr. Dollar, you know and I know she didn't have to marry him. She could have married anybody here in Culver or anybody in London or Paris. You see what I mean? And not quite. Well... I always had the idea that after she married him, she kept letting him know she could have had anybody else she wanted. Go ahead, Thurber. I think she married him for his money. I think she would have killed him for his money. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the whole affair becomes a town issue, and I become the town goat. Incidentally, let me take a moment to say thanks for the many kind letters you've sent. We appreciate them more than you know. And I only wish it were possible to answer them all personally. Again, thank you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Henderson. 
You asked me to call, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mrs. Henderson. I'm with Paramount Insurance Adjusters. Oh, yes. You probably know we asked for the inquest into your husband's death. Yes, I know. We're trying to clear up the entire matter as quickly as we can, Mrs. Henderson. I'd like to talk to you. Oh? Hate to trouble you at a time like this. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dollar. When do you want to talk? May I come out to the house this afternoon? There's a nice restaurant called Big Horn Lodge on the highway. How about meeting you there at, say, uh, 4 o'clock? Good. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Expense account continued. Item 7, 5 bucks. One pair of galoshes, believe it or not. It snowed in Culver, Montana during the night, all night. By morning, 14 inches of fine new snow covered everything in sight. After my phone call to Mrs. Henderson, I spent the morning trying to rent an automobile. There was none to be had, so that afternoon I dropped over to see Eve Holton, my sheriff friend. Son, you're going to catch your death unless you start wearing a scarf. Yeah, I'll remember that, Eve. But maybe I won't need one. Oh? Yeah, I think I'll be leaving Culver pretty soon. Well, I hope you don't mean that, son. I'm afraid I do. I'll have to tie this case up one way or another pretty quick. Why? My company wants me to get back home. I got a letter this morning. Oh, well, how can I help you? Well, for one thing, you can lend me your car again. I, uh, I have a date with a lady out at the Bighorn Lodge. <laughs> pretty fancy. You can have the old thing any time you want it. You know that, son. Who's the lady? George Henderson's widow. Yeah. Oh. Now, I know what you're going to say. Why go after her? Why bother her until I have something to go on? Well, I got to do something, Eve. I'm no nearer now to knowing whether Henderson was pushed out that hotel window, fell, or jumped. I think I have enough of an idea of Henderson and his wife to pick up some valuable information from her. Any objections? Nope. Johnny... A couple of days ago, you asked me to look up people who might have been especially friendly to Mrs. Henderson. You still want to know about them? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm working on it. Anyone so far? Nobody I'd put in that category. What time do you have to be at the Bighorn? Four. It'll take you a while. Wouldn't hurt to start right now. He's, uh, she's parked out back. Okay, thanks, Eve. Good luck. And don't let her wrangle you, son. She could do it if she wanted to. Goodbye, Eve. Ten minutes later, I was on the road to Bighorn Lodge, which also happened to be the same road I'd traveled two days before to attend George Henderson's funeral. As I drove past the graveyard, white and stark against the blue winter sky, I noticed a car parked along the side of the road, a little Chevy Coupe, about 1952. There was the figure of a woman, all alone, standing by George Henderson's fresh grave. Her head was bowed. She didn't notice me as I walked up. A gray-haired woman, about 45, slight, delicate, gentle. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to start you. Oh, that's all right. Must be getting late. Dear, it is. Uh, do I know you? Why, I don't know. I'm Maddie Knickerbocker. The name had startled me. The day before, an insurance broker in Great Falls had mentioned her. Told me that George Henderson had named her his beneficiary, then changed his mind a few minutes before he died. Your name's not Campbell, is it? No. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. You remind me of a boy I had in one of my classes once. Tory Campbell. Oh, you're a teacher, Miss Knickerbocker? (laughs) Yes, yes. Everybody knows me, I think. Or at least I flatter myself that way. (laughs) Well, I should be going. I, uh... I knew Mr. Henderson, too. Oh? He was a wonderful man, George. He was very dear to me. I'll find it difficult getting used to the fact that he'll never be around anymore. George had a wonderful laugh, didn't he? Yes. uh, Yes, he did, Mrs. Nickerbocker. I never really thought that he ever grew up. Of course, you knew him in a business way, and 
I'm sure he was very, very grown up in business. But it doesn't hurt to think of him this way now, does it? I don't think so, Miss Knickerbocker. I didn't come to his funeral. I didn't think I could bear it. I thought I'd just drive out this afternoon and say goodbye by myself. Well, I apologize for interrupting you. Oh, not at all. Please. <laughs> Funny little thing. Hmm? The birds in the snow. Oh. Such tiny, wonderful little things. A little bit of God in each of them, Mr. Dollar, wouldn't you say? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why. I think George would like to know they're here, near him. Miss Knickerbocker, I have to tell you... No, uh... you don't, Mr. Dollar. I know who you really are. Everyone in town knows. You seem like a nice young man. Was it curiosity that made you stop your car? Yeah, I suppose so. I apologize. Oh, you needn't. I'm just an old friend of George's saying goodbye to him. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Talking to Maddie Knickerbocker, I felt that for the first time, somebody, namely Maddie, had talked frankly and truthfully about George Henderson. I was still thinking of the frail, drab little woman with the nice blue eyes when I met Pauline Henderson at the Bighorn Lodge. What are these matters you want to clear up, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just some doubts in my mind about your husband's death. What do you drink? Perno. Perno. I learned to like it in France. All right. Uh, one perno, bourbon, a little water on the side. Yes, sir. You sound like George when you order. Hey, I like your Bighorn Lodge. And I have to say, when it's elegant in the West, it's elegant. I'd like a light, please. Oh, sorry. Sure. Thank you. Mrs. Henderson, do you mind if I don't stall any longer with the drinks, the smokes, and the compliments? I'm surprised you've stalled this long. I've heard you're a very blunt and impulsive man. I spoke to an insurance agent named Thurber yesterday in Great Falls. Your husband's agent. Mr. Thurber told me that your husband wanted to name a new beneficiary last week. Really? Yeah. He named Matilda Knickerbocker. Matty Knickerbocker. I'm not surprised, I suppose. Matty's a lovely woman. I know George was very fond of Mr. her. Mr. Thurber also told me that Mr. Henderson changed his mind about that the day he died. In fact, he phoned Mr. Thurber in Great Falls and told him to leave the policy as it was. He did that a few minutes after you left his hotel room. A few minutes before he died. Can you explain any of that, Mrs. Henderson? Why don't you ask Maddie Knickerbocker? Because I don't think she'd know. I ran into her this afternoon and I talked to her. Or not about this, just about other things. I'll look her up again if I have to. But it's you I want information from now. Then why don't you ask what you mean, Mr. Dollar? All right. Did something happen in that hotel room that made him change his mind about you? That's better. I do wish that ridiculous little man would bring our drinks. He will. Don't misunderstand what happened in the hotel room. George and I were going to be divorced. He moved out of the house a month ago. We went to his attorney's and drew up a tentative property settlement. You mean... Dunlap, Edder, Reardon, and Blake, Great Falls. They have a copy of that settlement. George was quite generous to me. So I didn't kill him for his money, if that's what you're thinking. Here we are, sir. Perno bourbon. Thank you. I didn't see George for mm, three weeks or so after we made the settlement. Then we happened to meet one day in Culver, and... Well, we had a rather bitter argument. It was one of those ridiculous things. We quarreled and parted very angrily. The whole thing was childish. My first impulse was to go right back to the lawyers and demand every unreasonable thing I could on the divorce settlement. I guess George's first impulse was to cancel me out as his beneficiary. Did you go to a lawyer, Mrs. Henderson? No. No, I cooled off. I cooled off considerably, Mr. Dollar. After all, George had been everything to me most of my life. I was truly sorry we never got along as man and wife. I'm glad that we made it up before he died. That morning. He apologized when I came by the hotel. I apologized. After I left, he fell out the window. 
Then I can assume that this business with the policies had to do with the argument. Assume what you like, Mr. Dollar. I can understand why you're annoyed by me and my questions. It's just that it's kind of hard for us to believe that a man involved in divorcing his wife would still name her as his beneficiary. I say that because of past experience. Oh, it's happened. But as usual. I could have told you that we were reconciled that day in the hotel, that we were going to drop the whole divorce matter, and that George was coming back to the house to live. Yes, you could have told me that, Mrs. Henderson. Mr. Connors in our home office in Hartford called you a few days ago. You hung up on him. Why? Well, I was very upset. I've never been a widow before. Uh Uh-huh. I believe you, Mrs. Henderson, sitting here like this. You're a lovely person, and I know it, and you know it. And this is a pretty nice place to conduct business. Why didn't you ask me to your home? I preferred to talk to you here. That's what I thought. I saved all the... Did your husband have any enemies? And did he seem depressed questions for another time? But before I went to bed that night, I read and reread Mrs. Henderson's testimony given at the coroner's inquest. The next morning, I interviewed all of the people at the Butte Hotel who'd been on duty the day Henderson fell out the window. After that, I dropped in to see Eve Holton. Here, here it is, Johnny, right here. Personal effects of the deceased included four suits of men's clothing, 14 shirts, five pairs of hose. Was there a bottle in that room, Sheriff? Liquor? Yeah. No, no bottle. Nothing like it, son. All right. He didn't call down and have a bellboy bring him a bottle or send him any drinks. The chambermaid swears there was no liquor in his room all the time he lived at the hotel. You say he was a light drinker. Now, what light drinker takes a nip before he has his breakfast? Who said he had a drink that morning? Mrs. Henderson. What? On the witness stand, under oath at the inquest. She testified that her husband had a drink before she came up to the room and while she was there. Now, mind you, she didn't say he was drunk. But she did say he had been drinking. You read over that transcript. So? So I think she threw that in, made sure it got in, because it's sometimes hard to believe that a cold, sober man will walk out of a hotel window and kill himself accidentally. A drunk or a drinker might do it. You and I and everybody at that inquest somehow got the impression that Henderson was slightly tipsy that morning. And Mrs. Henderson saw to that. Now then, if Henderson had a drink, I want to know where he got it. Tell me, Eve, no bottle in the room, no bottle brought up to the room. Where did he get that drink? That's a pretty good question, son. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Yeah, the whole case blows sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have a call for you from Hartford. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Right here. Connors at Paramount Adjusters. 
Say, what was this wire, Johnny? Are you serious about denying liability to Mrs. Henderson? I sure am. I think it'll bring the whole thing out in the open. This is pretty serious. Have you got any concrete evidence? death was an accidental? Jim, I have a copy of the coroner's inquest. Concrete evidence that Mrs. Henderson lied under oath. She said her husband was drinking the morning he died. Everybody here believed he was a little crocked when he fell out that hotel window. I've got proof that he didn't have a drink that morning. What proof? No bottle in his room. No bottle brought there. Nothing. What do you say? Don't make a move, kiddo. I'll get the first plane. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance at Justice Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Sheriff Holton agreed that there was enough of a doubt about the circumstances prior to George Henderson's accidental death to warrant an official re-examination of all the facts. He promised me the police would start an immediate investigation. That was all I needed. I knew Mrs. Henderson would be re-questioned and that the pressure would start to build up. Fourteen hours later, when Tim Connors arrived in Culver, I had some pressure of my own. Well, Johnny, what? Well, the best thing we can do now is move in. Deny liability on the grounds that the accident is not proved. I suppose Mrs. Henderson sues us. All right, let her. Then the burden of proving that her husband's death was accidental would be on her. Look, Tim, contrary to her testimony under oath, Henderson didn't have a drink that morning he died. All right, she made a mistake. He had a heart attack, got dizzy, and tumbled out of the window. He wasn't drunk. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Tim. Listen to me. Mrs. Henderson was ready for the coroner's jury a couple of days ago, and she was ready for my questions when I saw her yesterday. The only one she wasn't ready for was you a few days ago when you phoned a long distance. You said she hung up on you. Well, she half apologized to me for that, but it was because she couldn't think of anything to say. Well, maybe you're right. But suppose he did die accidentally, and suppose it is a just insurance claim. I tell you it isn't. Now, the fact that she made a mistake testifying about him having a drink and... Johnny, do you have anything else? Three things. Instinct, experience, and statistics. Pauline Henderson's a young woman. She married a wealthy older man. With him out of the way, she has all his money and all her youth. All right, I'm going to phone the company as soon as I can find a phone. Tell them I'm working for evidence, and the best way to get it is to bring Mrs. Henderson out in the open. File a complaint against her. What charge? Suspected murder. Oh, no, Johnny, that'd get us in all kinds of trouble. Remember the drink, Tim. Henderson didn't have the drink. Now, we'll have to have more than that. I'm sorry, Johnny. All right, I'll get you more. An hour later, I was with Sheriff Holden comparing notes. He reported that after questioning Mrs. Henderson, she admitted she might have been mistaken about Henderson drinking the morning of his death. She wasn't sure. But Eve Holton said what we both were thinking. He went in front of the coroner's jury and gave a misleading impression, son. Made us think that George was drunk and stumbled out the window. Well, uh, we better find out who helped her pull this off. Sheriff Holton had every man in his office working on the case by then. It was a long, tedious job of combing over everything in Pauline Henderson's background to find a possible accomplice. About five in the afternoon, I drove to the Henderson Ranch with Holton. Mrs. Henderson was out, but we interviewed one of the servants. That's right, sir. Once, twice a week. Uh-huh. You know where she drove to on these trips? I have no idea. Mrs. Henderson get up early in the morning, be gone all day. How do you know she went out of town? Well, she generally take a small suitcase with her, change of clothes. You don't take those when you're visiting a friend in town, do you? Tell us what car she'd use on these trips. A Cadillac. Always come back covered with mud and ice. Always have to be washed up. Mr. Henderson used to complain about that. About the car being dirty? About the trips, mostly. He and Mrs. Henderson had some pretty good arguments about him. He'd say Mrs. Henderson shouldn't visit that man. What man? Just that man. I never knew who it was they argued about. You've known Mrs. Henderson quite a long time, huh? Yes, sir. Know her when she was a little girl, when she first came here. Saw her grow up, go away to school, go away to Europe, come back a little more grown up and a little different every time. Were you surprised when Mr. Henderson married her? Well, no. Well... Yes, guess I was. Because she was so much younger? 
Well, not that so much. I mean, well, Mr. Henderson, he had something about the plains and cattle and mountains about him. When he moved, it was as big as all them things. And Mrs. Henderson was different. She didn't fit in here? Is that what you're trying to say? I think she fit. Not like him, though. Before they were married, they were sort of like good friends. I mean, they'd ride horses and go hunting and laugh and talk about different things. Mrs. Henderson, she traveled Europe, saw so many things and places in the world. She fit here, but then she didn't belong here. I feel awful about Mr. Henderson's being dead. If there was anything wrong with the way he died, I'd like it to be fixed. Mrs. Henderson will probably fire me for talking like this, but I don't care. This house isn't the same no more. By the time we got back into town, Sheriff Holton's boys had discovered the names of three men who had been seen at various places around Culver in the company of Mrs. Henderson. Rod Tyler. Oh, who's he? Mining engineer. He's been away from here for over a year now. See, now, here's another one. Sam Pollard. Sam died six months ago. Hey. What? Noah Baxter. Noah oh, Baxter. That name's vaguely familiar. Yeah, he owns a hotel you're staying in. A couple of ranches, too. Well, he might have been the one who tried to have you thrown out. Oh. He also owns the mayor. Young man? About 30, 35. Let's go see him. Another drive, this time north of Culver to the Baxter Ranch. We found Noah Baxter busy with his help shoring horns on cattle. A lean, tall man with thin features. If you're trying to find out if I've been seeing Pauline on the sly while she'd been married to George, why didn't you come right out and ask? All right, have you? No, not on the sly. There's nothing between us. George knew any time she came over here to see me. He was a good friend of mine. I'm sorry he's dead. Pauline's a good friend of mine, too. I'm sorry you people are thinking what you are about us. Let's go up the house. It's getting cold. All right, Stan, that's enough for today. No, I got to ask you this. Where were you last Thursday? The day George died, Sheriff? Yeah. I was right here. Can you prove that? <laughs> sure. Ask anybody. You boys want a drink? No, thanks. Oh, nice. No. Well, I do. Mac! Mac! I didn't get it myself. When was the last time you were in cover, Mr. Baxter? Three, four weeks ago. My cook and the others handle what supplies we need. Do you mind if we talk to some of your help around here? No. What do you want to talk to him about? About last Thursday? About what happened when Mrs. Henderson came here to visit? It wouldn't look good if she came here to visit me, would it? Well, that depends on the circumstances, no? Huh. Well, she'd come and sit there and read and look at some of those paintings. We'd talk when I had time. Anything wrong with that? No. Mr. Baxter, I think I ought to tell you... I've asked my company to file a complaint against Mrs. Henderson. Suspicion of murder. Oh. I'd like to tell you something. She didn't kill him and she didn't have him killed. She loved him a lot more than George loved her, I think. Both of you know her. Her dad was a drunken cowhand. When he died, George took her over, gave her everything. So you see, you're wrong. She loved George for giving her what he gave her and mostly for being the kind of a man he was. I lied to you a couple of minutes ago. There was something between us. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She'd come here to cry on my shoulder, and I... I let her. Cry? About George. He wanted to divorce her. Didn't you know that? I had the idea it was the other way around. <laughs> You're all wrong. George raised her, educated her, made her into a woman, and then he married her. And she wasn't what he wanted at all. You know who George wanted to marry? Matty Knickerbocker, the schoolmarm. Come on. Oh, there was nothing between George and Matty, but there would have been if he'd lived. What about you and Mrs. Henderson? Yeah. The thing that was between us was that I wanted her. She didn't want me, but I wanted her. 
I was glad when she told me about the divorce coming up. I really think she would have listened to me. But she wanted to be married to George. She really loved him. Sure you don't want one of these? No. No. And I really loved her. I went to see George last Thursday at his hotel. You know why? To tell him to go back to Pauline. Yeah. Because I knew what he meant to her. <laughs> you can talk to my people around here. They'd lie for me and say I was here last Thursday all day. They'd tell you that Pauline never came to see me. They'd lie right down the line for me. But, Mr. Dollar, I can't let you get out that complaint and take her in. One of my trucks was taking some beef to the hotel last Thursday. I rode in with the driver and went in the back way. I went right up to George's room to talk to him. Pauline had just left. I wanted to talk to him about the same things I've been telling you. I didn't want to hurt him. I loved him, the same as everybody loved him. When I got to his room, he wouldn't let me talk at all. He was mad that I interfered. He tried to swing on me. I shoved him once. He went out the window. That's all. I killed him. Expense account, item eight. Fifty-eight dollars and fifteen cents. Hotel and food while in Culver, Montana. Item nine, same as item two. Transportation by train and plane back to Hartford. Item ten, eighty-eight dollars. Miscellaneous. Expense account total... $802.50. Remarks? We still had to pay double indemnity. Maddie Knickerbocker, Pauline Henderson, Noah Baxter, they'll pay another way. With the hurt that comes to nice people. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a real mystery complete with plenty of action, a beautiful blonde, and a killer lurking in the shadows. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Irene Tedrow, D.J. Thompson, Herb Ellis, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Bob Bruce, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story... Of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>